Where are the tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one? All, all are sleeping on the hill. The following is an adaptation of Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River Anthology. It's a collection of short, free-form poems that narrates the epitaphs of residents of Spoon River. The epitaphs are recited by the deceased themselves. There's an ancient proverb, dead men tell no tales. Take a walk through the Spoon River Cemetery, where lie the deceased of the small town, Spoon River. Stop and listen. You may hear the dead citizens deliver their own epitaphs, tales of their lives speaking from their graves. They speak of the things one might expect to hear. Some recite their histories Others make observations of life from the outside. Some complain of the treatment of their graves. Some tell how they died. They reveal their disappointments in life. Some their success and failures. Where are Cassius, Chase, John, Oscar, Fletcher? The weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter. All, all are sleeping on the hill. Where are Dora, Lillian, Pauline, Daisy, and Lucinda? The tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one. All, all are sleeping on the hill. Archibald Higby loathe Spoon River for its lack of culture. I loathed you, Spoon River. I tried to rise above you. I was ashamed of you. I despised you as the place of my nativity. <sighs> but in Rome, among the artists, speaking Italian, speaking French, I seem to myself at times to be free of every trace of my origin. I seem to be reaching the heights of art and to breathe the air the masters breathed and to see the world with their eyes. <laughs> but still they'd pass my work and say, what are you getting at, my friend? Sometimes this face looks like Apollo's. In others, it has the trace of Lincoln's. <sighs> there was no culture, you know, in Spoon River. And so I burned with shame and held my peace. And what could I do? All covered over and weighted down with western soil, except aspire and pray for a new birth in this world with all of Spoon River rooted out of my soul. The circuit judge, who admits that he was dishonest, making unjust decisions that wronged many people. Take note, passers-by, of the sharp erosions eaten in my headstone by the wind and rain almost as if an intangible nemesis or hatred were marking scores against me, it, but to destroy, not preserve my memory. I in life was the circuit judge, a maker of notches, deciding cases on the points the lawyers scored, not on the, the right of the matter. Oh, wind and rain, leave my headstone alone. For worse than the anger of the wronged, the curses of the poor, was to lie speechless, yet with vision clear, seeing that even Hod Putt, the murderer, hanged by my sentence, 
was innocent in soul compared with me. A.G. Blood, the longtime honorable mayor of Spoon River. If you in the village think that my work was a good one, who closed saloons, stopped all playing at cards, and hailed old Daisy Frazier before Justice Arnett in many a crusade to purge the people of sin, why do you let the milliner's daughter, Dora, and the worthless son of Benjamin Pantier, nightly, make my grave their unholy pillow. Daisy Frazier, the town prostitute, who knew many secrets and was sent to court repeatedly and paid many fines as a result. Did you ever hear of Editor Whedon given to the public treasury any of the money he earned for supporting candidates for office or for writing up the cannon factory to get people to invest or for suppressing the facts about the bank when it was broke and ready to break mm -hmm. did you ever hear of the circuit judge helping anybody except the q railroad and the bankers did you ever hear of reverend pete or reverend sibley giving any of the money they earned for keeping still or for speaking out as the leaders wish them to, to the public waterworks. <laughs> but I, Daisy Fraser, who always passed along the streets through rows of nods and smiles and coughs and words such as, there she goes, <laughs> never once stood before Justice Arnett without first contributing $10 and costs to the school fund for Spoon River. Oscar Hummel, a town resident who was killed by A.D. Blood. I staggered on through darkness. There was a hazy sky, a few stars which I followed as best I could. It was nine o'clock. I was trying to get home, but somehow I was lost, though really keeping the road then I reeled through a gate and into a yard and called at the top of my voice, Oh, Fiddler! Oh, Mr. Jones! I thought it was his house and he would show me the way home. But who should step out but A.D. Blood in his nightshirt, waving a stick of wood and roaring about the cursed saloons and the criminals they made. You drunken Oscar Hamel, he said, as I stood there weaving to and fro, taking the blows from the stick in his hand, till I dropped down dead at his feet. There are more tales to be told. Should you be in the area, stop by, walk among the graves, listen to the wind, trees, birds, and listen for tales from the long ago departed of Spoon River.
This episode is called Mrs. Cordell's Curtain Lectures, and it's a collection of lectures given by a wife to her husband, Mr. Cordell. Now, these fictitious comical lectures first appeared in a Punch magazine in 1845, and although the lectures are over 150 years old, they remain amusing. And the lectures are delivered by Mrs. Cordell to her long-suffering husband and are usually spawned after he commits some minor infraction. In this lecture, Mrs. Cordell is nagging her husband, Job, because he had been to a tavern with a friend and came home a little bit late. yourself down. Harry! Drinking alone? You're the first friendly face I've seen in here tonight. Where have you been hiding yourself? I haven't seen you in a while. Been staying home, keeping the missus happy. You know her. Ah, you've been in the doghouse again. And what did you do wrong this time? Harry, it's a long story. I'm sure you want to hear it. Well, since I've no place to go except home, and there's plenty to drink here, I could use a good story. Oh, you asked for it. Remember the last time I was here? Sure. <laughs> you left a wee bit late, as I recall. That's right. And when I got home, I got another lecture. Uh, and what did she say this time? Well, I came home, it must have been about after midnight. By the time I darkened the door, maybe it was two. Well, I can't remember. But at any rate, I walked in that door. She was sitting right there in. Fine time to be coming home. Poor me. Ha! Huh. I'm sure I don't know who'd be a poor woman. I don't know who'd tie themselves up to a man if they knew only half they'd have to bear. A wife must stay at home and be a drudge while a man can go anywhere. It's enough for a wife to sit like Cinderella by the ashes while her husband can go drinking and singing at a tavern. I never sing. You never sing? How do I know you never sing? It's very well for you to say so. But if I could hear you, I dare say you're among the worst of them. And now I suppose it will be the tavern every night. If you think I'm going to sit up for you, Mr. Cordell, you're very much mistaken. You can go to bed? No, I'm not going to get out of my warm bed to let you in. Nor will Susan sit up for you either. I'll take a latchkey with me. No, you shan't have a latchkey. I'm not going to sleep with the door upon the latch to be murdered before the morning. Oof! <laughs> that filthy tobacco smoke. It's enough to kill any decent woman. You know I hate tobacco, and yet you will do it. I didn't smoke there. You don't smoke yourself? What of that? If you go among people who do smoke, you're just as bad or worse. You might as well smoke. Indeed, better. Better smoke yourself than come home with other people's smoke all in your hair and clothing. I never knew any good come to a man who went to a tavern. Nice companions he picks up there. Yes, people who make it a boast to treat their wives like slaves and, and ruin their families. There's that wretch, Harry Prettyman. See what he's come to. He doesn't get home until two in the morning, and then in what a state. <laughs> he begins quarreling with the doormat, and his poor wife may be afraid to speak to him. A mean wretch. But don't you think I'll be like Mrs. Pretty Man? No, I wouldn't put up with it from the best man that ever trod. 
you'll not make me afraid to speak to you, however you may swear at the doormat. No, Mr. Cordell, that you won't. Well, I don't plan to stay out till two in the morning. You don't intend to stay out till two in the morning? How do you know what you'll do when you get among such people? Men can't answer for themselves when they get boozing with one another. They never think of their poor wives who are grieving and wearing themselves out at home. A nice headache you'll have tomorrow morning, or rather this morning, for it must be past twelve. <laughs> That filthy tobacco? Again? No. I shall not go to sleep like a good soul. How's people to go to sleep when they're suffocated? Yes, Mr. Caudle, you'll be nice and ill in the morning. But don't you think I'm going to let you have your breakfast in bed like Mrs. Prettyman? <laughs> I'll not be such a fool, nor will I have discredit brought upon the house by sending for soda water early. For all the neighborhood to say, Caudle was drunk last night. No. I've some regard for the children, if you haven't. No, nor shall you have broth for dinner. Not a neck of mutton crosses my threshold, I can tell you. I won't want soda and broth. You won't want soda, and you won't want broth? All the better. You wouldn't get him if you did, I can assure you. Dear, 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 that filthy tobacco. I'm sure it's enough to make me as bad as you are, talking about getting divorced. I'm sure tobacco ought to be good grounds. How little does a woman think when she marries that she gives herself up to be poisoned? You men contrive to have it all of your own side, you do. Now, if I was to go and leave you and the children, a pretty noise there'd be. You, however, can go and smoke no end of pipes. I didn't smoke a pipe. You didn't smoke? It's all the same, Mr. Caudle, if you go among smoking people. <laughs> Folks are known by their company. You'd better smoke yourself than bring home the pipes of all the world. Yes, I see how it will be. Now you've well, once gone to a tavern, you'll always be going. You'll be coming home tipsy every night and tumbling and breaking your leg and putting out your shoulder and bringing all sorts of disgrace and expense upon us. And then you'll be getting into a street fight. Oh, I know your temper too well to doubt it, Mr. Caudle, and be knocking down some police. <laughs> and then I know what will follow. It must follow. Yes, you'll be sent for a month or, or six weeks to the treadmill. Pretty thing, that, for a respectable tradesman, Mr. Caudle, to be put upon the treadmill with all sorts of thieves and, and vagabonds and, and there again, that, that horrible tobacco and riffraff of every kind. I should like to know how your children are to hold up their heads after their father has been upon the treadmill. That's impossible. Why don't you go to bed, dear? No, I won't go to sleep, and I'm not talking of what's impossible. I know it will all happen, every bit of it. If it wasn't for the dear children, you might be ruined, and I wouldn't so much as speak about it, but... Oh, dear, dear, dear. At least you might go where they smoke good tobacco. But I can't forget that I'm their mother. At least they shall have one parent. <laughs> Taverns. Never did a man go to a tavern who didn't die a beggar. And how your pot companions will laugh at you when they see your name in the gazette. For it must happen. Your business is sure to fall off. For what respectable people will buy toys for their children of a drunkard? I'm not a drunkard. You're not a drunkard? No, but you will be. It's all the same. You've begun by staying out till midnight. By and by, twill be all night. But don't you think, Mr. Caudle, you shall ever have a key? I know you. Yes, you do exactly like that pretty man. And what did he do? Only last Wednesday. Why? He let himself in about four in the morning and brought home with him his pot companion, Puffy. His dear wife woke up at six and saw Pretty Man's dirty boots at her bedside. And where was the wretch, her husband? Why, he was drinking downstairs, swilling. Yes, worse than a midnight robber. He'd taken the keys out of his dear wife's pockets. Ha! What that poor creature has to bear. And he got out the brandy. A pretty thing for a wife to wake up to at six in the morning and instead of her husband to see his dirty boots. But I'll not be made your victim, Mr. Caudle. Not I. 
you shall never get at my keys, for they will lie under my pillow, under my own head, Mr. Caudle. You'll be ruined, but if I can help it, you shall ruin nobody but yourself. Oh, that ha, 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 horrible tobacco. As you see, she wasn't too thrilled about it, so I stayed home a few weeks till things blew over to keep her happy. Uh, saints alive, Job. How you can put up with that woman tis a miracle. Well, you should qualify for sainthood. Hmm. I'm thinking of buying earplugs. <laughs> For some music. Lord, help me walk another mile, just one more mile. I'm tired of walking all alone. Lord, help me smile another smile, just one more smile. I know I. Now I know I just can't take it anymore. What a humble heart on bended knees, I'm begging you, please help me. Come down and go the road to me, Lord. I need to feel a touch of your gentle hand. the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious reeds, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings. Grim visage war hath smoothed his wrinkled brow and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fight the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's bedchamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sport of tricks, nor am made to court an amorous looking glass, I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before some wanton ambling nymph, 
I that have curtailed a despair proportion, cheated a feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up. And that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I hawk by the bit. Gah! Why? I, in this weak, piping time of peace, had no delight to pass the time. Unless to view my shadow in the sun and descant upon my deformity. <laughs> and therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Why, I can smile. And murder whilst I smile. And fret my cheeks with penitent tears. And frame my face to all occasions. I can play the orator as well as Nestor, deceive more slyly than Ulysses could, and like a synod, take another try. I can add colors to the chameleon, change shapes with Proteus for advantages, and set the murderous Machiavelli to school. I can do this, and I cannot kind of set a crown ha! from this torment. I will free myself or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Beware, Clarence. Thou keepest me from the light. <laughs> Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams to set my brothers Clarence and the king, the one against the other, in deadly hatred. <laughs> and if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day shall Clarence be mewed up in the tower on a prophecy that says that C of Edward's heirs, the murderer shall be. Dive thoughts down to my soul. Your Clarence comes. Brother! Good day! And what means this armored guard that waits upon your grace? Ah, oh, tis not the king that sends you to the tower, Clarence. My lady Grey, his wife, tis she. Thus it is when men are ruled by women. We are not safe, Clarence. We are not safe. Farewell, my brother. I do so love thee that shortly I will send thy soul to heaven. <laughs>